Hello, I'm Charles Walters. Many of you will recognize me as the founder of Acres USA and as the editor of four volumes of the Albrecht Papers. I first met Dr. William A. Albrecht some 25 years ago. I had determined to start a new journal on biologically correct agriculture and I needed some updating rather rapidly. Dr. Albrecht took me under his wing, presented me with some 800 uh, papers that he had produced in his working lifetime, and then as I left one day, he handed me a film he had directed, The Other Side of the Fence. This film was not only a perfect introduction to his life's work, it was also an adequate commentary at the end of it. He had been removed from his position as head of the Department of Soils, University of Missouri, because he no longer would go along. Two false premises had swept the republics of learning, partial and imbalanced fertilization and toxic rescue chemistry, and these were not the truth. Albrecht believed that when the truth beckoned, it had to be answered, and his answer was his life's work. He had done some of the most meaningful research in the history of agriculture, and even today, the laboratories around the world use the Albrecht system for grading calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium as the four basic cations. And he explains this in the film that you are about to see. Dr. Albrecht believed that the old churchman's adage, dust thou art and dust thou shall return, was more than a religious sentiment. It was a scientific truth that should have been cast in bronze and put at the door of every college of medicine and agriculture in the world. For it's the dust of the soil and how they are assembled and bolted together that create nutrition in the plant, that create the livestock that is healthy and the human beings with minds that are capable of thought and reason. These are a few of the points that he will make in the film you're about to see. A minor classic that he asked me to preserve and the preservation is to give it to as many people as possible. There's a dumb animal for you. Whole big pasture all to herself and she sticks her neck through a barbed wire fence. Day after day, the same story. Go on, go on, get back where you belong. Go on, beat it. Mashing my fence down. Go on. What's the matter with you anyway? If I've got you out of that fence once, I've done it a hundred times. Why do you do that? Keep it up and I'm gonna get me a neck yoke. That'll keep you inside the fence. See how you like that. Dumb animals. It's a regular obsession with them, getting that grass on the other side of the fence. Ever wonder why they act this way? Here's another puzzle. Time after time, farmers have noticed their cattle grazing in one part of a pasture and never even touching other parts. Why is this? And how about the case of the particular pigs? You fill the feeder with grain and the hogs just ignore it. They go on eating grass instead. Hogs don't prefer grass to grain, do they? Makes a man stop and think. And sheep behave pretty strangely, too. Is it just accident that they choose one side of a pasture to do their grazing and never go near this side? Both sides look the same. Do animals see a difference? 
Let's go a little further. Why is it that one farm will produce good, healthy livestock, prime animals, while from other farms, apparently no different, will come thin, sickly stock? Who's to blame for this? Authorities say that the quality of our livestock is steadily declining the nation over. Despite improved stock growing methods, animal ills, deformities, and disease continue to increase. What's behind this threat to our food supply? Can it be something that has struck at human health? Eye specialists report an alarming trend toward failing vision. Hospitals are faced with ever-increasing numbers of children with bone diseases, crippling deformities. Dental clinics are finding that even in the youngest children, bad teeth are more and more prevalent. What's the reason for this apparent decline in our national health? And is this the cure? By the millions, people are turning to drug stores and prescription counters, seeking to regain their lost vitality. Medicines, pills, and capsules have become a daily ritual in American homes. Can there possibly be any connection between the loss of both human and animal health? Can there be some common cause for both? One man who pondered these questions was Dr. William A. Albrecht, chairman of the Department of Soils at the University of Missouri. For years, he had studied soils of every type in hundreds of localities, both here and abroad. He had studied the effects of various kinds of soil treatment, analyzed the results of neglect and abuse of the soil. And Dr. Albrecht's research led him beyond the soil itself into the field of animal nutrition. The analysis of feeding tests conducted with various types of feed grown on different types of soil. And eventually he had reached the subject of human nutrition, studying how foods grown on different soils could affect health, growth, and vitality, how the soil itself might contribute to illness. Dr. Albrecht's conclusions, drawn from 30 years of scientific research, are of vital importance to all of us. They may well revolutionize food production methods and bring new health standards to the nation. Says Dr. Albrecht, If we are to maintain health, our diet must provide us with the basic food elements common in our various foods. These essential foods have, of course, been subject to much talk and a great deal of food education in recent years. However, we have brought to light an alarming and significant fact. It is this. Today, there is no real way of being sure that we are getting the necessary elements in our diet, even if we eat what seem to be the proper foods. These two bunches of celery look pretty much alike, but this one, has plenty of food value, while this one contains not much more real nutrients than a glass of water. The same is true of these other foods. There is no way to tell by appearance which of these has food value. Intensive experimental work during recent years has shown us why two seemingly identical plants may vary so widely in their food value. In learning this, 
we've discovered why some farm animals fail to grow normally. And such discoveries have begun to show us what is undermining human health. Our loss of health today can be traced directly to the soil. Our farming methods have robbed the soil of vital food elements. And without those elements in the soil to nourish our crops, we cannot live. Let's consider the problem. When insect pests attack our crops, we can see the enemy. Therefore, we do something to eliminate the destruction. Or if our crops are overrun with weeds, again, the damage is obvious. So we step in to correct these conditions. But few of us realize that this plant might just as well have been destroyed by grasshoppers for all the food value it contains. Few of us recognize that this pasture is almost useless as feed. For like that plant, this pasture grows on mineral deficient soil. We've been fooled by the size of the crop, by the yields per acre. Only now are we learning that even big crops may bring troubles in the breeding and the growing of our livestock. Mineral deficient soils simply cannot produce good food. These animals had enough to eat, but what they ate lacked what must come from the soil to support health and growth. These same troubles are passed along to us, to our children. The result? Hospitals throughout the country filled with patients. Patients whose basic ills stem from improper nutrition. Young bodies crippled by faulty bone structure, racked with nervous disorders. The soil, drained of its nutritional elements, has become a major cause of physical and mental breakdowns. This is not theory. This is fact, established through years of study and experimentation. Under actual farming conditions, we have found that soil treatment can maintain the fertility of the soil so that it will produce a good crop year after year. Lack of treatment, we've learned, can destroy the very structure of the soil, making it barren and useless. And we've learned other facts that have altered our thinking on soils. We've found, for example, that the same crop grown on mineral rich and mineral poor soils may show marked differences as on these two pastures. But now we know that external appearances are just as often deceiving. Sometimes the best looking plant, the biggest and healthiest in appearance, can be the poorest in food value. Appearance alone is a poor index to food value. To check our findings, careful feeding tests were conducted upon successive generations of livestock. Results were tabulated until we could say what feeds grown on what types of soil would result in healthy, profitable livestock. Thus, little by little, our convictions grew. We can now say that deficiency in the soil may have little effect on the appearance and size of the crop at first. In some cases, a mineral deficient soil may continue to produce good looking crops for years. It's only when this mineral deficiency finally causes the soil body 
to start to break down, that the crops begin to show an unhealthy condition. Above all, we have learned this. Only by keeping the soil rich in minerals can we be sure of nutritious crops. Hence, healthful, nutritious foods for animals and man. Unless we keep the soil itself rich in minerals, our health declines. Since the soil is the source of all of our well-being, we should understand something of how it's made up and what's happening to it today. All soils originally came from rock, the only source of lime, phosphorus, magnesium, and more than half a dozen other nutrients. Under the action of heat and cold, sun, rain, snow, and wind, this rock has been broken down, first into large particles that we call gravel. Some of these particles break down to form sand, Additional weathering transforms some of the sand into silt, and from the silt eventually comes a substance called clay. These materials constitute the body of the soil. Only a small part is made up of humus, the decomposed plant and animal matter. This is good soil, young soil. The reason it's good is that it still retains the original elements supplied by the rock from which it was formed. Let's see how it contributes to plant growth. The soil's simple function is to provide a footing for the plant's roots and to store water for them. The plant builds its bulk from a few nutrient elements taken from water and air. But plant growth should not stop with the formation of bulk. About 5% of what the plant needs comes from the soil itself, and that important 5% consists of minerals. We might visualize plant growth this way. As the plant develops and pushes its roots through the soil, these roots form active hydrogen. This hydrogen dissolves the minerals out of the soil particles, allowing the minerals to enter the plant roots. In effect, the plant trades hydrogen for mineral nutrients, mining nutrients from the soil, leaving hydrogen in their place. Within every plant, there's a factory. Now, we don't know how this factory does it, but in some fashion, the minerals from the soil are manufactured into food elements. These are vital to health, and they can't be produced except by the growing plant. To assure growing plants a plentiful supply of these minerals, nature sets up a soil treating system. The plant takes minerals from the soil as it grows. Then when the plant matures and dies, it goes back to the soil to decompose into humus. Its mineral content is returned to the soil. But more than that, the very process of decay releases chemicals that break up more rock releasing more minerals for next season's crop. As the cycle continues, the soil grows richer. Nature's method of replenishing the soil with minerals worked well until we upset the cycle. Our farming methods take away from the soil, but put nothing back. Each year's crop removes a portion of the minerals from the soil. Crops are harvested and carried from the fields so that plants themselves can't return minerals to the soil. Eventually, through continuous cropping and cultivating, the soil is mined of its minerals. More than that, the humus is taken away, leaving a thinner layer of topsoil. And so now, the plant grows this way. When the roots extend through the soil, they find few minerals to be released for entrance into the plant. The hydrogen supply keeps building up in the soil, causing the soil to become sour or acid. And the plant's food factory lacks the raw materials to do its job. 
It lacks the minerals that will provide food elements vital to livestock and man. All around us are the indications of our negligence in caring properly for our soils. Malnutrition, disease, deformity. A race of people whose health is dwindling to new low levels. These represent results of mining rather than managing the soil. But that's not all. Drained of its mineral content, the body of the soil loses its strength and stability. It fails to grow cover. It falls victim to the rain, the wind, the floodwaters. Thus, the loss of minerals from the soil spells loss of animal and human health, and moreover, the loss of the very soil itself through the action of erosion. It is a gloomy picture, but not without hope. Some of our soil has lost much of its fertility. Our irreplaceable topsoil has grown dangerously thin, but still, we're not too late for corrective action provided that corrective action comes soon. That action must include the replacements of the minerals we've mined out of our soil. In short, fertilization. We must determine for each portion of the land exactly what minerals are lacking and then apply these elements to the soil in the right amounts. This is the way to restore fertility to the soil to combat erosion, to safeguard our most precious natural resource, the topsoil. As a matter of simple economics, our course is clear. The initial investment in soil treatment pays almost immediate returns. Many crops fully repay fertilizing costs the first year 